Very good. Good to see you all. Andrew, John, Sunshine from down under, Vasily Key and Andrew. Uh, seeing everybody, everybody seeing us good. Very good. All right, let's get started. Let's say the prayer and then we'll come back and do some introduction from uh, for the uh, lesson tonight. So let's say our prayers as usual. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of the divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind and the understanding of the gospel teaching. Implant us also fear of thy blessed commandments to trample down all carnal kind of desires. We may enter upon a spiritual man of living, both thinking and doing such things you will please unto thee. Now the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God, unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thy fathers from everlasting. Now holy good in life, creating spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. <clears throat> Evlongi ton si Christe on the on Simon O pan sofus to salis anadixas Canta pemsas aftis to pnevmanto aigion Que de afton tini kumeni saiginevsas filantrope doxa si. Amen. God help us with the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Holy Apostle Peter, the Holy Venerable and Godly Father Paisios. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Jesus Prayer. The first of several lectures on the Jesus Prayer, which should be uh, an essential part of your daily spiritual struggle. Everyone here tonight should be praying as much as possible, the prayer. And so we're going to talk about that, which is such a huge part of our spiritual life. It's so basic and so important. And uh, we're going to be talking about an introductory. It's an introduction tonight. And we're going to be using a beautiful little book that you may or may not have seen that's been published and circulated in Greece, but has really not probably seen uh, a lot of circulation in the United States. I'll share with that with you in a minute. I'll actually give you the link. Let me, uh, before we get to the, uh, uh, the, the literature, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, PDF, I want to share with you some of the literature on the topic in case you're entirely new and you've never, you know, there's people here who are totally new to the Jesus prayer. And it's important that you have uh, in mind uh, the text that, let's see, we get you some links here. I'm going to give you some links here in a moment that you get uh, connected to the right text, right? That you're connected to the right material. And I'm going to open these up here. Uh, in uh, Amazon, though, I would prefer that you all find a way to buy these um, through uh, St. Anthony's Monastery or an uh, Orthodox source like, I don't know, Eighth Day Books or something like that, uh, because although we all use Amazon, it's it's good to support you. A little more support goes to the publishers. Just like our books, if you, pub, if you buy it from our site, we get a little better income, and that helps our work. So it's always good to do that and support the publishers, and I'll give you the links in a moment. So before we get into the actual PDF, which is uh, prepared for you tonight, we're going to look at uh, the uh, the literature. Let's go first to uh, the following. Let me share it with you on the screen. This is a nice little uh, booklet that uh, actually was produced... Uh, you see that there, the prayer rope. It's just a little Kindle, three dollars. You know, I recommend this little text, and because Saint Nicodemus Monastery has has translated and published it, it's actually I'm pretty sure it's actually a, a original text is from. Let me see if I could if they mention it here. It's from. The Monastery of Sirapotamo, if I'm not mistaken, on Mount Athos. And it is uh, 
pretty universally known in Greece. I mean, it's a, a little booklet that's been circulated widely. Uh, so I highly recommend that if you're just totally new to the Jesus prayer and you want to you wanna learn about the basics. Uh, and it's going to be more or less what we're doing tonight. So we're going to give you something similar, but you can go a little bit deeper with that. So check that out. The Prayer Rope, St. Nectaris Monastery, uh, available uh, at the monastery, of course, but also on uh, on Amazon. Now, another text that you're going to want to be familiar with, if you're not already, which is a fine uh, introduction, is this text here on the Jesus Prayer Guide uh, to uh, unceasing prayer found in the way of the pilgrim. This is by St. Ignatius Bryanchaninov. And this is actually an excerpt from, I'm pretty sure it's an excerpt from the arena, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, I, maybe it's published uh, originally as well as a separate uh, text entirely. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure this was originally in the arena, if it's not still in the English edition of the arena. Let's see. Yes, uh, here it is. On the Jesus Prayer is taken from se his several volume ascetical works, uh, the arena. So it's just an excerpt, but that's also a phenomenal text. But that's mainly from monastics, the arena, and very uh, it's available from Holy Trinity uh, Press in uh, Jordanville. Now another text that I want you to be familiar. If you're not, again, this is an introductory tonight. We'll get next week. We'll go deeper into the practical, more practical. Uh, this is a, a phenomenal text that should be reread. If you've only read it once, reread it. I've read it several times, and every time it seems like it's the first time. The Way of the Pilgrim, and it is a classic text on the Jesus Prayer, highly recommended by saints, including St. Saint Joseph the Hesychist. So the Jesus the Jesus Prayer here, uh, phenomenally uh, developed, but just a an amazing story as well. Beautiful read. Uh, so check that out. Now, this is a, a one version. I'm not really sure who the author is, but I recommend you go to St. Anthony's Monastery and get their version. Same text, but different version. St. Anthony's Monastery. I don't think um, you can find it on Amazon. I'm, seeing, I'm searching here. Uh, but so go to St. Anthony's Monastery and get the Way of the Pilgrim from there. I'm just uh, showing you the first thing that came up. Now, the... Uh, and then one more text I want to share with you, if you're not familiar with it, and that is, let's see if I have it here. No, let's see. We did the way of the pilgrim and Jesus prayer prayer rope. Oh well, the the text tonight is what I want to show you. So you can you can you can acquire the text that we're using tonight for our class from Holy Trinity Seminary, a monastery, uh, the Church Supplies, uh, that's up in Jordanville, and they have it uh, imported from Greece. $21 uh, right there. Uh, so you can, you can, let's see if they have, yeah, you can go right there and get, this is the, this is the text we're going to be using tonight and the next couple of weeks, if you want to uh, actually acquire uh, the, the very text we're using. Uh, based on Elder Paisios largely, but also on contemporary, other contemporary elders. Uh, and this is our commander, Arsenios. Now it's interesting. I had a, the blessing uh, to meet our and to work a little bit with Father Arsenios uh, in, during our years in Greece, and he would uh, he would uh, frequent a uh, meeting of fathers in Volos that I would attend uh, pretty regularly, and uh, he has his own monastery down in La Mia. So there, that's our author tonight. That's who we're going to be using, and um, he was a disciple. Um, uh, frequented i'm not sure if he was actually living there maybe he was i'm not sure sure if he was actually living there in the presence of elder paisers in other words going on on athos often to him in any case he seems to be pre, very well acquainted with the elder and his teachings so uh all right so let's go to the actual pdf that i've created for you tonight and um and if you're new again you can go to the uh question box here in this version uh in patreon uh, we're also live streaming to uh, orthodoxethos.com. By the way, all of our people over at orthodoxethos.com could, uh, we have not put any kind of uh, password or Patreon requirement to get into tonight's um, uh, Patreon stream. So theoretically, if you're over at orthodoxethos.com, you want to join us over at Patreon, you can do that. Go to the Crowdcast uh, link uh, for, let me, see, let me actually give you, 
give you the link here on the screen. This is where we're at. You can all join us if you want to come over from orthodoxethos.com and put it on the screen here. One moment. Um, banner. And this is our link tonight. This is where we're at. Right there. All right. Just go to crowdcast.io slash C slash on the Jesus prayer. And you should be able to get in. There's no, as far as I, I mean, that's the way I set it up. But it, Crowdcast has been giving us issues occasionally. And so hopefully it's not, it's, it's not going to be a problem. But if you want to come over and join us that way, you can also submit your questions. And I was going to say for everybody who wants to submit questions, we have two questions right now. On the right side of the screen, uh, just over by the uh, on the side of the uh, screen uh, to the right of the uh, chat box, you have a little question box that you can uh, submit your questions. All right, so um, I've got two already. Well, I got one uh, and uh, another comment. So we got one question. All right. There you go. Thank you, Justin, as always, for giving us the links for everybody. That's very kind of you and good. Everybody in the chat, you can see the links that the, the books we're talking about. All right. So tonight we're going to be talking about the Jesus Prayer. But as always, we begin and we always try here, uh, Orthodox Ethos, try to follow the Holy Fathers because as the great Joseph Verenios, who was writing about the struggles of the monks, he was a learned monk in the 15th century in the monastery of the Studios, a great tradition of the monastery of the Studios in Constantinople. He said, is it impossible to come to know the truth or to grasp theology in any other way but by following the saints, by following the Holy Fathers? And this is what we try to do here at Orthodox Ethos as much as possible. So we're always continually putting up on the screen the words of the saints that we all must follow. And the first thing we're going to talk about tonight is the scriptural passage or passages upon which the frequent repetition and dedication of all the saints of the church to the Jesus prayer is based. Uh, and there are several. One of them is from Luke 18, 1, where our Lord said, and it required, it's recorded there, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray. Pray unceasingly as the Apostle Paul says, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The great theologian, St. Gregory the Theologian, famously said that the remembrance of God is better than breathing. Uh, indeed, this is the um, behind the Jesus prayer and what is more important for the soul even more than breathing for the body, is the prayer of Jesus for the soul. And so standing in the presence of God, which we will do eternally, and even after our departure from the body, obviously this we're going to be in the presence of God, and we're going to be constantly, the question will be, do we embrace that presence, enjoy and revel in that presence, love that presence, that's heaven, or will we cower from it, reject it, uh, and that would be a hellish existence when the presence of God yeah, and not enjoying the love of God because we reject it. And so it is far superior for the soul to be constantly in the remembrance of God. And that's what happens. That's the goal of the Jesus prayer, to be in the pr presence and remembrance of God continually. Uh, and then it is for the body to even breathe. There's simply nothing more important than to stand in the presence of God. The great hesychist and theologian, St. Saint, uh, Saint Gregory Palamas, uh, who himself was a great defender of the Jesus prayer, of course, in his battle against Varlam in the 13th century, 14th century, rather. Uh, and uh, this is something we should dedicate some teaching to in the near future. God willing, everybody should become very well versed in the uh, struggles of the great hesychist and Archbishop of Thessaloniki, uh, Gregory Palamas, against the uh, Latinizing Western monk from southern Italy, Barlam, who came over and uh, 
was irate that they would suppose that they're actually uh, the saints are actually seeing the uncreated light and not a created light, and that one can pray unceasingly through the Jesus prayer. And so Saint Gregory, at some point, descended to Thessaloniki from the Mount uh, of Athos, and there uh, was teaching the people uh, the art of the Jesus prayer. So first and foremost, we need to give a defense because unfortunately in our day, there are still clergy, apparently under the influence of the Western Latin theologians, but maybe also just ignorant of the teaching of the fathers or have had bad experiences with people who've fallen into delusion. I'm not really sure. It's a bit of a mystery to me why there exists a portion of the clergy today who reject the idea. I just had someone sp uh, write me a few weeks ago and said, my priest told me, do not pray the Jesus prayer. Do not say the Jesus prayer. And you don't need, by the way, a spiritual father because you're not a monastic. And these are weird ideas that I don't know where they get them from, certainly not from the saints. Uh, and so St. Gregory teaches us under, with, you know, with no qualms the following. Let no one think that it is the duty only of clergy and monastics to pray with, without ceasing, it should be, and not of lay people. So that's a typo, without ceasing. Let no one think that it is duty only of clergy and monastics to pray without ceasing and not the duty of lay people, laymen. No, absolutely not. It is the duty of all Christians to remain always in prayer. This whole dichotomy, this whole distinction between, oh, the monastics do this, the lay people do that, we're not monastics, that's not found in holy tradition and in the saints. You can't base it on scripture because clearly in Holy Scripture, there's only one gospel, there's only one path, and then all the same standard will be applied to everyone. So we are we we are in delusion, unfortunately, if we think, oh well, I'm not a monastic, I don't need to pray unceasingly. It's not call, I'm not called to that. That's not true. Of course, that's not true. We want to be in the presence of God continually, always praising the Lord at all times. Let there be praise on our lips, it says. And he says, using the Jesus prayer, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm going to have mercy on me, a sinner, or just Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on me, the shorter version, which is preferred by many elders today and used. This we can always do if we wish. We can always do, he says, if we wish. For when we sit down to work with our hands, when we walk, when we eat, and so on and so forth, we can always pray noetically or mentally in our noose, in our spirit, in our inner man, right? And is, this is as this is pleasing to God. Of course, God wants to continually be in communion with us and for us to be continually clinging to him so that the enemy of our salvation and the passions and the evil thoughts have no place in us. And he says, let us work with the body, but pray also with the soul. So St. Gregory Palamas as an inheritor of the holy tradition clearly defends that you and I and all of us outside the monasteries are called to engage in unceasing prayer. We're gonna we're gonna present the views at the end tonight. I'm gonna go quickly through them after I get done with my PDF of uh, a, a large group of contemporary elders and saints uh, talking about the necessity and the and the importance and the benefits of the Jesus prayer. Uh, after we go through uh, our presentation of uh, Father Archimandrite Arsenios' uh, present uh, introduction and the views of Saint Paisios, who you see now on the screen. Let me pause and make sure that we're good. Everything is good. Everybody has sound. Everybody has uh, uh, Sometimes I go on and people are screaming at me, Father, we can't hear you, Father, we can't see you. I want to make sure everybody's good. Give me a heads up. And then also that we have um, the video coming through okay. Because sometimes I, when I go to see the preview, sometimes it's showing me a very old image for some reason. I want to make sure you all are seeing everything. So... Don't see any issues. Keep going. We're going to keep going. Make sure if you have questions, you can put them in the question box, right? And we'll go back now to the lecture. Everything's working. Very good. All right. So 
The elder was asked, how do we approach God initially? How What's the right way to say the Jesus prayer? How do we do it, Yeroda? How do we do it? And the elder said, well, just like the radio station. What do you do there? To locate and listen to the radio station, we need to adjust two buttons. We have the frequency and the volume on the radio, right? That was the main technological means of back in the 70s in Greece. Television wasn't even that ubiquitous in the 60s and 70s. And certainly on Athos, they don't have much of any technology back in the day. So they may, So the radio was well known to everybody. And he said, look, you got frequency and volume. You got to get the right frequency. And then you can turn the volume up. Well, the volume is logic. And the frequency is the heart. He talks a lot about the frequency and be and and bringing your heart into the right frequency of God to be able to come and commune with Him. You know, teaching and, and, and training your heart to hear and commune with God. It's very, you uh, very much in His teachings, and so you can't just have the heart or just the logic. Actually, you need both, and both have to be put in the service. Both the news and the the and the rational intellect, uh, both the mind, the rational intellect, and the heart, the spirit of man, needs to be attentive, given over to God, to pay attention to God. He goes on, he says about the unity of prayer and all of life. The elder stressed that the humble way, the humble way of walking, the, the, the stance, the humble stance, Uh, I, mean, I want to find where we are because I'm going to be also some things that are off screen here that we want to to include. So, yeah, uh, he he would say uh, that the elders stress the humble way and walk and uh, and the question of having good thoughts cultivating good thoughts. And he would say, what we need here is more watchfulness and less prayer. Uh, sometimes we think, well, it's just saying the prayer, just say the prayer, right? But actually the, the Hesychesi tradition is very much focused also on nipsis, which is translated as watchfulness or, or um, uh, mindfulness or, um, uh, let's see, how does he put it elsewhere? Attention. All right, so attention and, and watchfulness, uh, not being distracted. But we're so distracted today. We're so extremely, and I am guilty, and we're all guilty with these technology everywhere. And the, the ease of communication, it just it increases the problem of attention. And so a lot of times the problem is not that we need to double down on prayer, but we're not praying with attentiveness. So he says there's also this. So there's two ways. Uh, uh, not just the simple way, but there's multiple things that have to happen if we're going to uh, make any progress with the Jesus prayer. So there has to be a unity of life and prayer. Some people think, well, I can live whatever, I can do whatever, I can you know, watch television, I can go to movies, I can do all that, and I'll say the Jesus prayer in the morning. You're undermining your, your, your prayer. You're basically taking one step forward if you're taking one foot forward and two steps back when you're engaging in a lot of things like that, that are going to be distractions that are going to be, um, you know, fill your head with thoughts and going to undermine your attentiveness. You're undermining your own spiritual struggle. Another time he said, I thought can block or unblock the prayer. A thought can block or unblock the prayer. When we don't forgive or ask for forgiveness, our prayer not only doesn't fly up to heaven, it doesn't even rise above our own head. This is an expression he used quite a bit. It was a metaphorical question. So uh, metaphorically saying this is about where the prayer is going to uh, arise. It's not literally saying that the prayer goes up to our head. But it's a way of saying it. It's, we're not going to make progress. We're not going to have communion uh, and, and, and compunction and contrition, all the fruits of this communion with God, if we don't forgive and ask forgiveness. How many people? are surrounded by difficult circumstances, people 
in their life and they cannot, they're constantly engaged in some turmoil or some division or bickering and arguing and people are being offended and offending and all the rest. The passions are at work and they, they cannot forgive. They cannot let go. They cannot see the image of God in spite of the sin. They cannot love the sinner and hate the sin. And they, they, they merge the two in their head. They reject the person. They became angry and passionate. And little do they know that's all an obstacle to prayer. Our prayer will not ascend. We will not feel the grace of God and be transformed by the fruits of communion if we cannot have communion on both the human, the horizontal plane, forgiveness of all and everything, loving our enemies, and the vertical plane, loving of God. So, so I love God, I love God, but that guy, I hate that guy. <laughs> you can't hate that guy because he's made in the image of God. If you hate that guy, you don't know God. You actually confess, you know, I don't really know God. I don't know, because he loves him. Even though he hates God, he's an atheist, he's whatever, right? He's very sinful. Whatever. God still loves him. Even though he turns away from him, even though he blasphemes him, God still loves him. Compassion for him. He sees in him the image of God. The image is never fully erased. So we can never say, well, that man is so evil that I can hate him. Nope. Can never say that. The image is never fully erased. It's always there. If you have eyes to see, you can see your God. It says in the, in the Yerodikon, have you seen your brother? You've seen your God. The whole idea here is you have to go to God through your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, whoever it is, it's your neighbor. So first and foremost, if we want to say the Jesus prayer, we've got to make a decision right now we're going to make progress in Jesus' prayer. Then I'm going to forgive everyone everything. I'm going to love them in spite of whatever they do. And I'm going to pray for them. And I'm going to feel compunction for them in spite of whatever it is that they're enslaved to. They're liars. They're cheaters. They're murderers. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Because God loves them no matter what they do. We have, we have lives of saints where people were great ascetics. They ended up murdering someone. We have a, a saint who actually raped and murdered someone. Believe it or not, he was a great ascetic. He fell into the depths of sin. He repented. He re was restored because of his repentance. It was so deep. And he actually ended up working miracles at the end of his life. So Nikitas of Kiev, I think, is the name. There's actually several saints. There's Saint Yakovo, Saint James, also a similar story. Of course, we have Saint Mary of Egypt, a well known sinner who brought many men into perdition through her licentiousness. And the list goes on. So there's no one out there that you can that you can justify yourself in remaining out of communion with through god now they might not like you they might reject you they might continue their sinfulness they might even continue to persecute you that's their problem that's their sin that's their self-condemnation they will not ever come to christ and repentance through your hatred of them through your rejected of them that's for sure but not only will they not come but you will not come to god if we cannot learn to forgive and love as God does. So communion with God means we become like God. We make progress in becoming like God. So do not think that, oh, I just got to say the prayer mechanically. I can do it. I can make progress. If I just, I'm like the, I'm like the, the pilgrim. I'm just going to imitate the pilgrim. No, you've got, of course, the pilgrim struggled as well, but I'm saying don't think about externals only. You've got to reorient your whole life and bring itself, bring yourself into Harmony with the commandments of God and obedience to the commandments of God, which includes loving our enemies. It's one of the main characteristics of this of the Christian. Moving on, the elder says that we must not confuse uh, the forms and the prayers that we're saying as an end in themselves. So repeating the Jesus prayer is not the end. I've done that. I do it every morning. I do thousands of Jesus prayers every morning. Therefore, I am a spiritual person. Not necessarily. 
it's a means to an end. If you're not praying with compunction and love and all the rest, you don't have a relationship, as you'll see here momentarily, then that external repetition in and of itself is not. That's the vain repetition the Protestants reject and, and mock and say, oh, you, the Jesus prayer is vain repetition. And the answer, of course, is it's repetition, but it's not vain if you're praying with your heart. So just because it's repeating doesn't mean it's vain. They think, well, every repeated prayer that's repeated must be vain. No. Somebody even was confused in the Orthodox Church years ago, some Protestant converts who wanted to try to convince the Metropolitan and the Antiochian Archdiocese that he should stop the 40 Lord have mercies. And he kind of stopped and said, well, maybe we should. I don't know. It seems kind of vain repetition. He was convinced by these Protestant converts, the poor Metropolitan. No, there's nothing vain in and of itself because it's 40 times. It could be a thousand times, depending on our heart, how we pray. And you can stand in, in the, you know, during Compline every night and say, Lord have mercy 40 times as we have in the, uh, after the uh, canon or after the, uh, you truly meet, there's 40, Lord have mercies. You can say them mechanically and that can be vain. Or you can say them with compunction and they'll not be vain. So this is one of the tragedies of our Protestant friends who don't understand Scripture because they don't live the life of the church. And though the Scripture is a closed book to them, although they almost treat it as an idol. And they come to it and they say, here, will you? I've got the quote, I've got the passage that proves that you are worshiping idols. I've got the passage that proves that you're vainly repeating yourself. And yet they don't understand because they don't have the life which is a presupposition for understanding the scriptures. So it's not an end in itself, brothers and sisters. It's a means. Prayer is a means to communion. That's the end. That's salvation. That's the, that's the whole point. To have a communion and to be in the presence of God and to live the grace of God. The presence of God is the grace of God. The elder says, we should contemplate God's infinite benefit and affections in our and our innumerable known and unknown sins or omissions. All right, so we're preparing ourselves, we're trying to say the prayer. We want to become people who have the prayer, acquire the prayer, say it continually. We want to if, if we're gonna do that, there's two things we have to have in mind continually. We've talked about this a lot, it's very basic, but it repairs it bears repeating. And that is we're constantly, how do we stand before God and what is our, uh, what is our, um, in our inner world, what are we doing? How do we stand before God? So the elder says on, there's two things. On the one hand, it's how we view God, how we understand God, how we see God, right? His love and mercy and that, we, we have to have that constantly in mind. We stand before him and we say, uh, you know, thou art the light and I am enlightened my darkness. Thou art the love and give me who am full of pride and hatred. And, and, and you juxtapose and you stand before him. And this is what it means to have self-knowledge and God-knowledge. In Greek, it's theognosia, God-knowledge, and aftognosia. Nosi is knowledge, afto self, aftonosia, and theognosia, God knowledge. It's a whole book written by St. Justin Popovich, uh, examining the teachings of St. Isaac the Syrian. It's his PhD thesis, I think, in, in, in Athens back in the, what was it, the 20s. And the whole, the whole focus there. Uh, is on the knowledge of God. The whole book is on the knowledge of God. You can't come to the knowledge of God unless you come to your self-knowledge. Those things are inseparable. And so they go together. They have to be maintained simultaneously before God. So who is God? Who am I? And then that knowledge of self will bring you to compunction and contrition and the proper stance uh, before God so that your prayer is, is fruitful. So these, the knowledge of the innumerable and the mindfulness of our innumerable sins and transgressions and omissions and blindness and all the rest, these will all generate humility within our, within our souls. 
a salvific cardiac pain. This is how they translate it. It's interesting, cardiac. Cardiac key is the Greek word. They just transliterated it. Of the heart, right? The pain of the heart. Father Seraphim Rose talks about this a lot. The pain of the heart is the key. If you stand before God with pain of heart, a lot of us stand before God like the Pharisee. A lot of us focus on externals. A lot of us focus on dogmas alone. We don't go any deeper in our own. We don't repent. We're afraid to come to terms with our own insecurities, passions. We're afraid to face the reality of who we are, what we do, how we pass our day, all the rest, right? So you got to have that pain of heart, the salvific pain of heart. And thus, in this stance now of self-knowledge, pain of heart, mindfulness of sins, mindfulness and knowledge of God and his greatness and glory and love, the prayer will not be a conventional and tiresome thing. People say, I say that prayer, it's tiresome. <clears throat> well, that's because you're not, you're not observing the presuppositions. But it will rather be instead a personal, natural need for the invocation of divine mercy, but also for glorification. So having observed these presuppositions, having the right understanding of God and yourself, standing with compunction and contrition and mindfulness, then the prayer becomes an existential, essential need of your body, your soul and body, your, your being. And you cannot but stand and say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me and feel the every word. Every word, Lord, Jesus, Christ, have mercy on me. The mercy, especially, we should feel it deeply. And, and this prayer then becomes a constant expression of your inner person. Constant expression of your inner person. So important. These are the presuppositions. We talked about tonight's talk is going to be about introduction prerequisites and benefits then we'll get into the technical stuff later we're gonna talk a little bit about technical stuff tonight but not a lot so then the elder and the uh, father Asenios talks about we have the enemy he's always warring against us right he comes he tries to distract us and he tries to drive us into despair he tries to drive us into mad mad because of our thoughts right we're going crazy can't focus so instead of sitting there and becoming a, and being a victim, turn it around. Turn it around on him and say, I'm going to use your machinations against me for my own benefit. And then he talks about a story here. I think I need to, I think I've actually skipped one or two things that I wanted because I couldn't put everything on the screen. So um, yeah, they were actually right here. So he says, we must not be surprised, especially during prayer, that the enemy does not rest. Actually, we need to exploit his activity by making him an unpaid laborer who actually prods us to persist in unceasing prayer. So he's coming and he's bothering you. And, and if he sees that actually this drives you further to prayer again and again and again, and you don't give up, this is the key, faithful to the end, you don't give up, what's going to happen? He's going to say, well, this isn't working. With my temptations, my machinations, my uh, bothersome presence, all it does is make him pray even more. And he he knows very well that the prayer that really counts is the prayer that's offered when we're the where we don't want to pray, when we're tired, when we're distracted, and we persist. That is expression of love for Christ, and therefore it is beneficial. And the enemy knows that. So no matter how and what fruit you have, that's really in God's hands, for the most part, what I mean, what He sends you, right? In His great and inscrutable wisdom, the struggle is in our hands. We have to constantly struggle, and that, that in and of itself is an expression of our love for God. So don't ever think, well, it's just nothing's coming of it. No, just keep going and keep loving. So the elder was far more concerned about this stance, this. Uh, way of being and praying than he is with the technical uh you know uh, techniques that have been developed by the hesychist over the 2000 year history of the church especially talked about during the hesychist controversy in the 14th century those things are secondary he, of course he'll use them if, if they're helpful to concentrate but 
What's really important here is that we are standing with compunction and contrition. He says something here that's very, I think, very profitable, and I didn't put in, it's a bit long. He says, before counting knots on our prayer robes, in other words, how many prayers we're going to do, 300,000, 2,000, 5,000, whatever it is, right? We should instead count our innumerable sins and read a patristic text in order to attain awareness, self-awareness, mindfulness, thus escaping from mundane things. So Elder Sephroni also talks about this, that when you're before you start your prayer rule, and of course he's talking about the monks getting up in the middle of the night, you know, two in the morning, whatever, five in the morning for us, four in the morning, whatever it is, and we're getting up to say the prayer, we should begin with a patristic text, which is going to be a life of a saint, but also a text that brings us to compunction and contrition, a patristic text about the spiritual life, you know, path to salvation or the writings of somebody like St. Paisios and, and whatever it might be that we're reading, bring us to that. Get us out of the day-to-day. Oh, I've got to go shopping today. Oh, I've got to do this today. All right, we got to get away from that and elevate our mind to things divine. And he says, you escape the mundane things. You focus only on the words of the prayer, that we should also ignore all of our musings without exception. And this is something we don't do very well. I certainly struggle the most. I'm sure I'm the worst, and that is I'm constantly musing about, well, what am I going to do for the team? What am I going to do in the fall for the conference? What am I going to do about these books that we need to get published? And, and it never ends, right? And that's that's I make the good work that we're trying to do, the enemy of my own salvation and my spiritual benefit. Stop. Put it aside. Don't think it's not time for that. And I'm I, I, I'm very, unfortunately, the worst. I'm the worst. The personal ones, the impassioned ones, the demon, not demonic ones, these musings, right? So you got the personal, the impassioned thoughts, uh, you know, the demonic ones, those from the left, those from the right, the, the left of the fleshly, worldly, the right is super correct, you know, I'm the best, the Pharisee, all right? Put the good ones even aside, the blasphemous ones, of course, but even the good ones, even the good thoughts, put them aside, he says. All right, and come to stand with compunction and pray and focus on the words of the prayer. There's a story he talks about. Uh, there was a spiritual struggler who, when lying down to sleep, would be besieged by demons that gave him unclean thoughts. All right, so he's a monk, he's in his cell, it's time to go to bed. And immediately, the minute he puts his head on the pillow or whatever he's using as a pillow, here come all the unclean thoughts. And then you know what he did? He got up. Thank you, devil. Thank you, demon, for reminding me that I need to pray. And he would get up and he would be for, he would do many prostrations. And what would happen? One, two, three, 10, 20, 50, whatever. Eventually, the demon stopped doing that. And he was. He was given peace, at least from that struggle. So the, the elder placed great importance on the <clears throat> the healthy, proper conscience, having a clear and clean conscience. Obviously, that means that the one who's going to make progress in prayer is going to be going to confession. He's going to have a spiritual father. He's going to go off and he's going to write his, the best thing for all of our beginners out there, for everybody, really. We're all beginners. Uh, we're all like catechumens, as, as Father Stephanos Agnostopoulos told me years ago. We're all like catechumens today. So we're all beginners. Very important that you are constantly writing down your sinful thoughts, sinful desires, and omissions, and, uh, and you're keeping a track of it so that when you go to confession, you're not going... And thinking, what did I do this whole month or two or whatever it is that I until I since the last time I went to confession? Your the success of your confession, and therefore your conscience's purity and peace is going to depend on your mindfulness of your own sins and writing them down and then bringing them as a package. Now, here is who I am, Father. This is who I am. I see that I have done this sin 40 times since I saw you last. I've done this 12. 
Uh, I've constantly in judging. I'm constantly angry. I'm constantly yelling. I'm constantly la lazy. I'm slothful. I'm this. I'm that. You, you don't know how many people go through their life. They don't even recognize their sinfulness. They have no idea that they have these passions. They're not paying attention to the inner life. This is so important. If we're going to say the Jesus prayer with, and we're going to make progress, you've got to take care of these things, get them in order, put them down, have mindfulness, and eventually make progress in putting them behind you so that the life and the prayer go together. This is one of the main messages. The life and the prayer have to go together if we're going to actually be able to say the prayer. It's not a mechanical thing. It's not just your desire. It's not just the words. It's not, a, it's not externals. You've got to have a consonant life with the prayer to make progress. And so the elder says in our next slide, the key, as I just said, is a proper healthy conscience and a spiritual stance before God and man. We should only ask for divine mercy in our prayers, only for divine mercy. Lord, have mercy. That's what we should ask for. Not Lord, give me this. Not Lord, I want to go to university, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you can, you can do that. But in our prayers, we really want to make progress. We don't put that. God knows what we need. He knows we need a, a husband or wife. I was just talking to somebody in New Mexico the other day. And new guy to the church, very interesting. He says, I want to find a wife. How am I going to find a wife? I don't see any Orthodox ladies around here. <laughs> he said, well, you're not going to find a wife. God's going to find you and send you the wife when you're prepared spiritually, which means you've got to go deep, become faithful. You want a pious wife? You say, where are all the pious wives? Are you a pious husband? All right, so make sure that you're focusing on the mercy of God. He knows what you need. Don't go search. I'm going to find a wife. You're not going to find a wife. And if you do, you might be a big mistake. God will send you the wife in due time because that's what he wants, your salvation. And that's why you get married, for salvation. You don't get married to have lots of kids. That's a secondary thing. You don't get married to, I don't know what, have a companion to have a nice life with. The whole point of everything that has the internal significance is our salvation. Why do we get married? To get To be saved. To save our souls. That's why you get married. That's why you're with your husband or with your wife to save your soul. First, foremost, and everything else is secondary and everything serves that ultimately. The children come because they're going to help you save your soul. Right? You're going to have to deal with the passions of your husband because it's going to help you save your soul. In other words, become purified, become illumined, be come into communion with God. Everything has to serve that purpose, all right? So it all goes together. It's all organically one. You can't say, ah, I'm a good Christian. I go to church every Sunday. That's just one little part. Many other parts to this story, this whole identity, this whole acquisition of Christ-like life. We should only ask for divine mercy in our prayers in order to repent in a manner pleasing to God and thus be forgiven in order to see our wretched state more clearly and in depth. You go low, you go down, you go humble, humble, you humble yourself, he exalts you. You seek to see your sins, he gives you the divine light. That's how it works. Can no cease, empty oneself, and he exalts. That's what he says. The humble will be exalted. The low of, low of state will be exalted. The valleys will be exalted, right? That's, that's what, that's, you go... God, give me eyes to see my own wretchedness. Open the eyes of my mind to understand the gospel teachings. See my own sinfulness. Only thus will God give you his grace. Only thus. And whatever is necessary for your salvation and your fellow man's salvation. All right, so see how it all is about salvation. What you need for salvation, he will give you if you go as he did, and you empty yourself, and you see everything that needs to be corrected, and you do not shy from it. Many people they don't want to they don't want to smell the stench, they don't want to face their their weaknesses, and therefore they don't make progress. <clears throat> Unless we come to abhor ourselves. In a godly wise manner, not with any trace of despair, we shall continue to tumble into two new pitfalls, both latent and evident ones, right? So unless we 
come to see ourselves and abhor our, our, our wretchedness in a godly way, according to God, not in despair, but in hope always, that harmolipi, the joyful sorrow of the life in Christ, always together, not just not just one, not just the other, right? He says, St. Siloan says, as I wrote above here, keep thy mind in hell. He doesn't just say that. He didn't stop there, period, and despair not. That's what the elder is saying here. You keep your mind in hell, what? You see the, uh, the what is not heaven, which is wretchedness, sinfulness, and yet you don't despair. And then God brings the light in the hope and the salvation. While we yet in darkness, he came and saved us, right? When we yet in blindness and he was incarnate. So now we move a little bit to something more practical, just to give you an idea here of what the elder was telling monks. Somebody, I know that's what everybody wants to know. How many? It's all about numbers, right? Give me the numbers, Father. How many supposed to do? I mean, what's the practical thing? I just want to get started. I want to say the prayer. What's the practical side of it all, right? Well, that's just a very, very minimal part. If you don't do the rest, it's just a you're spinning your wheels. But we're going to talk about that. And you're going to be blown away by the level of prayer that he and the monastics and athos are doing. Look at the numbers. What do we see here? Four times 300. So the Jesus prayer rope, let me actually show you my uh, prayer rope here. So we have a, uh, usually the prayer ropes come in 33, 100, and then 300, right? So this is a 300 here, right? And this is the one he's talking about. And some of them have this little thing on the end here where you can actually have a little counter. Can you see that there? There's a counter here. And so, you know, depending on how many you're doing, whatever your prayer rule is, you count those up, 100s or 300s or whatever. So here he's talking about 300, which is the, the prayers. 300, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. But he says four times 300. What he means is 300 to Jesus Christ, 300 three times, so 900 times. And then 300 to Most Holy Theotoko, save us. Right, 300 to Christ, 100 to the Mother of God. That's what I have there in Greek. XP is Christos in Greek, and MP is Mitter Theu. Mitter, it's for the word mother. So 300 times 3, 900 to Christ with small prostrations. That means a small, uh, uh, a sign of the cross and a small, a small um, bowing. So he's saying that's the first thing we do. And then we go and we do another four times 300. Free. Free means you don't have to do the, the sign of the cross or prostrations or small prostrations or bows or whatever. You can do whatever you like, whatever you feel like. And then you do another four times 300. 300 to Christ, 100. 300 times three. That's what that means. 300 times three to Christ and one times 300. 300 to the mother of God. For the living, so you pray for the living. Those, all those who ask, who've asked you, who are alive, to pray for for them. You maybe commemorate their names. He doesn't say this, but I'm I'm guessing you commemorate some of their names in the beginning, and then you begin the Jesus prayer. And then for the reposed, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on the servants of God. And then you say the prayer four times. You don't say, Lord Jesus Christ, necessarily. You could. I don't think there's a Hard fast rule. St. Peter doesn't seem to think it's a, it's a necessity. I don't think it's a problem if you do it, but um, you could say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on the reposed or the grant rest of the soul, souls of thy servants, and then say the prayer. And then finally, one times 300 for the saints of the day. This is a total of 17 times 300 or 5,100 times every night. You would be saying this every night. If you were a monastic on Manathos, this is a rule that he gave to monastics. So they get up at one in the morning and they'd probably take them. I'm guessing that, I'm just guessing that most monks 
to do four times 300. I don't know how long it would take for the monastics who do this every day. It gets shorter and shorter. Um, 20 minutes. You say, what? 20 minutes? Yep. 20 minutes. I would say 20 minutes. So that's 20, 30 minutes maybe. And then times one, two, three, four. So that's two hours and something for the prayer rule. 5,000 times. Why am I telling you this? We're not going to be doing it. None of you are going to do this prayer rule, just so you know. None of you are doing this prayer rule. I mean, I'd be surprised if anybody tonight is going to do this prayer rule. This is a this is a hard prayer rule for the vast majority of people in the Orthodox Church, but for monastics who are praying all night, every night, and this is their main diaconima, in other words, service to the church, this is their bread and butter, this is the center of their whole day, right? Uh, but it gives you it gives you a sense of the degree of prayer that the monastics are are striving for and they're engaged in, and it becomes that's it becomes second nature, it becomes a way of life. The prayer goes deeply into their mind and heart, and they obviously uh, can make much progress. It does matter ultimately the quantity, but not first and foremost. Quality is the most important thing. With compunction, with the heart, as you're going to see in a minute, we're going to quote a variety of saints and how much they uh, focus on the quality, the, the the heart that has to be in the prayer, obviously far more important than the quantity, but it, quantity comes. Quantity with time, you have an increase in quantity, and that's uh, not insignificant. So the elder says about these, about the prayers, whatever prayers you're doing, you must not rush through them just to say them without any kind of sense of the words, right? Do not just go, Lord Jesus Christ, 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 Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if that's if you can say it that fast and have compunction, I guess that's fine. But very few people can do it. So one of the things he says, you cannot rush through this, otherwise you're going to lose the benefit. He wants you to keep the three to one ratio. Three to Christ, one to the Mother of God. So if your if your prayer rules, uh, as probably many of us have a prayer rule, maybe three hundred and one hundred every morning, three hundred to Jesus Christ, one hundred to the Mother of God. That would be a very basic beginner prayer rule for most lay people, right? Just three hundred times the Lord Jesus Christ, one hundred to the Mother of God, or if you even have one hundred and thirty three. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You're that's where you are, that's where you start, that's where you go, and you keep that rule. The most important thing is to keep the rule. Don't give up. You fall today, you get up tomorrow, you do it again, you make it up, or if you don't make it up, you keep going and you go to confession, you say, I didn't make that up, and you struggle. Uh, you'd never give up, but that ratio is what you want to keep. So it's 100 to 300, 100 times Jesus Christ, 33 the mother of God, 300 Jesus Christ, 100 the mother of God. 600, 200, 900, 300, right? And and so forth and so on. And then he encourages and, and talks about deep prostrations as being very beneficial. So when you make a prostration, there's the small prostration we talked about, which is basically a, just a, a, a bow and, or half a bow, depending on uh, you know uh, what we're talking about. There could be different circumstances. Deep prostrations when you actually touch your head to the floor. And, you know, you're begging God to give you compunction and contrition. You're begging God to give you, to have mercy on you. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And you're saying the prayer as your body goes down, your head is hitting the floor and you're coming back up. And then he says, be careful because they're not, the fruit of this is not a grief. I just had somebody write me a couple of days ago and said, I'm full of grief. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And they explained, I said, that's not of God. And the grief was mostly almost pity, pity, and um, self pity, and uh, doubts, and things like that. That's not of God. So the elders says, "Be careful. That's not the fruit of the prayer. Peace, deep peace, which passeth all understanding, according to the Saint Paul. That which is of God. 
which is not in the mind, it's in the heart, and it's in the deep man. And he doesn't worry, he doesn't have anxiety, no matter what's going on, he's at peace, all right? That's the fruit of, of a deep prayer life, all right? So that's a few things. Uh, if you're saying it to absorb it, if you're saying it with your heart, that's what you're going to see. Now, I put this here, even though it's in the list of things we're going to go to in a minute, but I thought this is very helpful, practical, helpful things here. The question is, what are the necessary spiritual conditions in order to practice the noetic prayer of the heart? The prayer we all know, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, without the risk of being deceived or being overtaken by the devil. This is a question said to the saint, Saint Paisios. And he says, among other things, this is not an exhaustive list. He says, bring to mind our sins, first and foremost, five minutes. Remember our sins, remember our wretchedness, remember our falls, remember not to despair, but to bring ourselves to compunction and contrition. You don't go back to fleshly sins and think about them. That's not what he's talking about. Just bring your the basic faults and sins that you commit. Anger, pride, arrogance, judgmentalness, slothfulness. Think this is who I am. All right. This is the reality. Blame and criticize and accuse yourself. Don't blame God. Don't blame your neighbor. Yourself. Blame yourself. Remember death, judgment, and hell. This is also what Elder Fram talks about and St. Joseph the Hesychus were doing at the beginning of their prayer roll every night. Remember death. Remember the judgment. Remember hell. Remember what it means to fall away from God. Remember these things. They wake you up. They're like water in your face. They're like, you know, shock. Wake up. This life is short. We're leaving. Wake up. There's hell for those who don't love and don't have communion with God. What are you doing? Wake up, all right? Then he says, essential for noetic prayer of the heart. That's the advanced state of Jesus' prayer, where you are you have it going on within you continually. And you're always in the presence of God, and it's a gift of God, ultimately. All of this is a prerequisite to making any progress in the prayer and, and on the path to this the the goal of the jesus prayer participate of course in the divine mission of the orthodox church repentance confession communion that goes without saying i think everybody knows that have humility which attracts god's uncreated grace so humility we talked about earlier how important it is and that a big big part of that is is standing with full uh cognizance of our sinfulness now there are many presuppositions commemorated in this book by father arsenios and these should be well known to all of us, but it bears repeating. These are necessary to make progress in the Jesus prayer. Number one, prayer offered in a spirit of humility. Prayer offered in a spirit of humility. With profound self-awareness and self-deprecation, without any excuses or idealizations of our falls or bad behavior. Well, I, I said that, but I, I was justified. Well, I'm a good person. That person doesn't love me. And all this other kind of justifications. No, no, no. Be like the tax collector, he says. What did he do? He didn't lift up his eyes to heaven, but he simply cried out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We are all tax collectors. Who were the tax collectors? They were the pariahs. They were rejected by the Jewish people. They were betrayers. They were traitors to the Jewish people. They were taking the money from the Jews and giving it to the Romans, the persecutors, conquerors. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There must be no enmity with our fellow man. Number two, no enmity. We said this before. The Lord's Prayer right there. The Lord says, if you don't forgive, it won't be forgiven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's how it works. You don't forgive, you're not forgiven. What is forgiveness? Communion. You don't have communion with your brother in love, compassion. You don't have love and compassion and communion with God. Those two things we said earlier are inseparable. Very, very important for us today. There are going to be more and more temptations as the society dissolves, as people become animals, like animals, Oh, my goodness. All that temptation to hate, the temptation to hurt, even to kill, may come upon society as things dissolve, right? Lawlessness brings many temptations with our fellow man. 
the boundaries break down, we have problems, temptations. People, are, I got to get a gun. I got to protect myself, my family, all the rest. I understand that. But are we also cultivating love and understanding and communion, even though we have that pistol in the back? Are people talking about that as much and much more than the preppers? Are we doing that? I mean, is, I wonder. I don't think so. Prayer should be accompanied by secret acts of charity. Secret acts of charity. It's so important to hide our virtues. Don't talk about the money we give. Don't tell people we're giving money. Don't go around and say, I'm giving money. I'm giving money. No. Secret acts of charity. Only God sees them. Somebody came in and asked, uh, I think it was St. Arsenios. Maybe it was St. Arsenios we just celebrated. I don't remember. And he said, what's the most important virtue he said the one that's done in secret the one that's done in secret prayers must be accompanied by the humbling of the body ascesis asceticism fasting prostrations both in quantity and quality all right so that's important to make progress in the prayer of jesus our prayer must first be of the spiritual dimension. Seek first the reign, the rule, the kingdom of God. That's the kind of prayer. We pray for those things, the heavenly things. That's the first thing. We, when we stand before the icons, we pray to our Lord. We don't say, Lord, give me a new Corvette. <laughs> I need a house. I need this. I need that. I need the food. No, we first say, first, God, give me the kingdom of God and Help me see my sins and repent. This is the thing we seek. Seek first the reign, the rule, the kingdom of God. Our prayer must be with faith, complete trust in God, in his loving providence. That trust is so important. All the problems, many of the problems we have, many of the problems we have today, many of the psychological problems, many of the spiritual problems, many of the broken homes. What is the cause of it? Where's the begins? It all begins with a lack of trust in God. That's the basis of all spiritual life. And the absence of that is the basis of all sin and of all fallenness. It's the lack of trust in God and his loving providence. Number seven, an orthodox stance of faith, of way. Orthodox dogma and ethos. God is spirit, the Lord said. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship him. You cannot pray to him and have progress if you're not in truth and in the spirit of God, which means you're in the faith the Orthodox, the one holy Catholic Apostolic Church, and you're confessing the faith. If you're talking heresy, you're preaching heresy, you're in a more you're talking and spreading immorality, you're not going to make progress in the prayer. It's not going to happen. And more, there are more presuppositions are really, uh, of course, many, uh, but the main ones we're talking about here, tears. Ultimately, the church fathers and the saints talk a lot about the need for tears, for weeping. Somebody wrote me recently and said, I have tears. I said, what kind of tears? Well, I have tears that make me feel like melancholy or something. I forget exactly what she said, but it wasn't. But that's not godly. Those aren't godly tears. The tears that God sends are tears of, of, of compunction and contrition and weeping for our sins. But much more, they're tears that are sent, which are of a, an overwhelming sense of gratitude and glorification of God and his mercy standing in awe, being overcome by his love, being immersed in his divine uh, grace that brings about just a purifying weeping. Perseverance and prayer, even when we don't feel like it, this is also very important. It is, he says, uh, Father Arsenio says, it's delusional to stand and say, I'm only going to pray when I feel like it. If you're only praying when you feel like it, you're, he says, in delusion. That's pretty, that's pretty, uh, what can I say? That's pretty uh, clear, right? Not a lot of room for wiggle there. So uh, you say, well, should I pray when I don't feel like it? Absolutely. That's when you begin to pray. That's when you begin to love.
He says, praying, this is it, Father Arsenios, praying, of course, observing the commandments that we talked about, praying is, an, is, an, is not an end in itself. It is a means for approaching closer to God. Our primary goal should be the discarding, the altering, the, the about face from the old man. Not praying while clinging to our old habits, our passions, and our weaknesses. This is delusional. Like if we if we cling to our old passions and habits and weaknesses, and we go to pray, it's not going to work. At least we got to say, "Lord, I'm weak. I'm slothful. I can't get off this. Help me!" Right? That's how you stand. You recognize all your weaknesses. You don't justify it. You don't continue. You don't seek to continue in it. You seek to be freed of it. If you fall, you get up. You repent. But you don't stay there and say, I'm going to make progress in the spiritual life. So when we insist on holding on to our old passions, right? So let's say before we started life in Christ, we were overcome come many times by jealousy. Now we recognize that. We recognize the jealousy. And yet we fall into it. And because we just go back again and again to the vomit, that's us holding on to our passions. Ultimately, we're responsible for that, right? And we're aware of it. We understand we're doing it. We're going back. All right, we're not going to make progress in prayer. And we might even fall into delusion. Right? We're giving rights to the devil. We're playing with the things of God. We're playing with prayer. We're approaching God, but not in a pure and loving and, and, and humble way. And we're saying, God, God, God. And then we go back to the pit. God, God, God. And then we go back to the fornication. We go back to the adultery. We go back to the jealousy, the killing my brother with hatred and all the rest. And that's not going to work, folks. That's not. That is that is the first fruit of prayer is going to be this illumination so that we can discard the weaknesses that we have. Right? So if you're making progress in, the, in getting out of the old man and making progress in overcoming the passions and making progress in seeing, well, seeing your sins and, and making progress in overcoming them and putting them aside, that's the fruit of prayer. That you're seeing them and you're struggling against them, that's the fruit of prayer. You, you will not have that fruit, both of them, right, to go together. Struggle on the one hand, prayer on the other, those two things lead to a change a repentance that's change of mind and heart, a change of way, no going back, no going back, right? That that means you're truly repenting. That makes you're making progress. You need both. You need both. You can't just have one. You won't make progress otherwise. Now, I'm going to share with you the views of quotes from these saints that I found online. I thought they were very good in one place. I'll put this on the screen here. So we're going to hear from St. Paisius again, St. Joseph the Hesychus, St. Paisius Velutskovsky, who's in Next to St. Pius was on the on the, his left. One of the greatest saints in the last 500 years, St. Pius of Vyskovsky. St. Ephraim of Katonakia. St. Sophronios of Essex on the left here. And then to the right of St. Joseph of Hesychus, you have St. Amphilochios of Patmos. St. Seraphim of Sarah, of course, and Elder Milianos, who's not a saint, glorified, but many hold him in high reverence for his piety. So let me share with you uh, the, uh, the web page. And the quotes that I want to share with you, hang on. And we'll begin with St. Seraphim and Seraph. Fantastic and very didactic um, for us. What was the Canaanite woman shouting behind Christ? All right, so this is... Uh, entitled here this has been entitled here the jesus prayer in holy scripture so we're just talking about where we find it in holy scripture well here's one what was she begging for have mercy on me O lord son of david my daughter is badly demon possessed and after the lord tested her faith is to set an example for future generations to this day he worked the miracle and said oh woman great is your faith let it be done as you for you as you desire so from this lord have mercy saint seraphim says the theology and the noetic prayer of the heart begins. All right, so right there in Scripture, we see many examples of this. Crying out to the Lord, Lord have mercy, right? And the whole Hesse Castle tradition is based right here, begins right here. This is the kernel. This is the little kernel, the little seed that became this massive tree of the Hesse 
ortho orthodox noetic prayer uh, tradition. All the art consists precisely in this, whether walking, sitting, standing, working, or being in church. You see how he says being in church. He includes being in church. Keep this prayer unceasingly on your lips and in your heart. By calling on the name of God in this manner, you will find peace. You will attain purity of spirit and body. And, of the Holy, and the Holy Spirit, the source of all good things, will dwell in you, and he will guide you in holiness to all piety and purity. Here is the key. Sitting, standing, working, anything you're doing, call on the name of God, Lord of mercy, the Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on me. All right. First, second now, St. Paisa Velaskovsky. We saw him, uh, the, the icon earlier. What does he say? The Jesus prayer is work common to angels and men. With this prayer, people attain to the life of the angels in a short time. The prayer is the source of all good works and virtues and drives the dark passions far away from man. In a short time, it makes a man capable of acquiring the grace of the Holy Spirit. Acquire it, the prayer. Before you die, you will have acquired an angelic soul. Listen to what he's saying. This is so encouraging, so beautiful. This is a man who did this his whole life. He taught thousands of monks in Romania. He was on Athos. He became the greatest, one of the greatest teachers of the prayer in the history of the church. Spread throughout Russia because of him. Translated all the patristic texts. Total renewal in Optina and in Valam. And this is largely due to St. Paisios. He says, the prayer is divine rejoicing. No other spiritual weapon can so effectively restrain the demons. It burns them as fire burns a wick. So you want to be free of the demons and the passions that so easily beset us? Then you need to say Jesus' prayer. Number three. The benefits of the Jesus prayer. St. Amphilochios from Patmos. With this prayer, the Lord Jesus Christ have mercy in me. You will benefit in every way. With this prayer, man is purified, enlightened, sanctified. The prayer is the lifeline of the soul and of the body. The prayer is the foundation of perfection. You will become eth ethereal. And you will fly with the prayer. One of the signs of the prayer is this lightness of soul, joy, peace, simplicity, right? Feel like you're walking on air, like you just got baptized, just walked out of the baptismal font. You're walking on air. You'll become eth ethereal. There is no other way to salvation, purification, and sanctification than the noetic prayer. It has filled paradise with holy people. Listen to what he says. There's no other way to salvation except through the prayer, the constant remembrance and being in the presence of God. The prerequisites now. We already read this. We're not going to do it again. You remember these? Very important. Members of sin, self-reproach, memory of death, participation. St. Joseph the Hesychus. When I arrived in the Holy Mountain, this is how to pray the Jesus Prayer. Listen to how, how he describes his beginning. When I arrived in the Holy Mountain, I sought among the righteous hermits those who were practicing the prayer. There were many then, 40 years ago, who had life within them, men of virtue, old-fashioned elders. From then... We made one our elder, and we had their guidance. That was Elder Ephraim. Now then, this is the older Elder Ephraim, that then Elder Ephraim in America got his name. Now then, the work of noetic prayer is to push yourself to say the prayer with your mouth continually, at first rapidly, so the noose will not be inundated by the waves of formed thoughts. Pay attention only to the words, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. When this is given a good amount of time, the noose gets used to it and says it. The noose meaning the spirit of man and the inner man, right? Not the not just the brain. And you are sweetened like when you have honey in your mouth. All you want to say is, is to say it. If it leaves you, you are greatly distressed, All right. So if you reach a point after praying and praying and praying and you stop praying, you, you say, oh, no, no, I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop. I want to keep praying. That's a good sign. When the noose gets used to it and is filled, when it has learned it well, it then sends it to the heart because the mind provides the nourishment of, for the soul. And whatever good or evil it sees or hears, its job is to bring it down to the heart, the seat of man's spiritual and physical powers, the throne of the mind. Now here, the word mind here, I'm not sure if they're using it. And I would like to see the Greek. Uh, I wonder if they're using it as diania or, or, or noose. But they do say noose here, so you would think it would be Dianya. Okay. So then, when the prayer, one praying restrains his noose from imagining anything, 
and attentive only to the words of the prayer, then breathing lightly with a little compulsion and volition of his own, he lowers it into his heart, holds a closed trial within, and says the prayer with rhythm, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. In the beginning, he says the prayer a few times and takes a breath. Later, when the mind is accustomed to saying it in the heart, he says a prayer with each breath, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Say the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy with your tongue, and then with your noose, without ceasing. When the tongue becomes tired, let the noose begin. And again, when the noose is burdened, the tongue, just do not stop. Make many prostrations. Keep vigil at night as much as you can. So then, when praying occupies his noose, he imagines nothing, but pays attention only to the words of the prayer. Now from St. Ephraim Kazanaki, of course, the disciple of St. Joseph Hesychus, his co-struggler, but really a disciple. He was taught by St. Joseph and also uh, glorified and the saint of the church today. He says, say the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on Say each word one by one with attention, with understanding. Do not proceed to the second word if you have not comprehended the first. Emphasize the ending more. That is, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Now there will come at first listlessness, sleepiness, restlessness, carelessness. But be quick to pull yourself together. When you say the prayer, consider yourself now at the beginning that you are in hell and crying aloudly, asking for the mercy of God. Keep thy mind in hell and despair not, he says, right? Consider yourself. That's where you are. What will you do? What would you do? Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. You would cry out. That's what he wants you to say here. That's the point he's trying to get across to you. At the same time, you distance yourself from despair, hopelessness, and such feelings which are not from God. God does not encourage man to despair. He does not bring man to hopelessness. He does not encourage any of these feelings that are de demonic inspiration. During the time of prayer, do not admit any imagination, any form, any image of Holy Virgin or the, of the Christ or any saint nor should you even see the words of the prayer noetically. Don't focus on the prayer. Don't think Lord and imagine the word Lord. No, you say it and you focus on Christ noetically, not on anything created, not anything, anything in your like in your mind's eye that's your imagination, right? Why must we pray without ceasing? St. Paisus the Athenite says, we must continue to say the prayer without ceasing within our heart and our noose. Only the name of our Christ must remain. Because when we leave the prayer, our communication with God, our communion with God, then the devil starts with thoughts and he makes our minds spin. And we no longer know what we want, what we are saying, and what we are doing. All right, so it's one or two things. You know, people say, oh, the, you know, things are not black and white. Yeah, well, maybe, but here they are. If you leave the prayer, the blackness comes. You go back to the prayer, the blackness leaves. That's what he's saying. It's really that simple. The demons do not... Stay among and in those who say the prayer. They cannot coexist with the prayer, with the loving, compunctionate heart that is praying to, to the Lord and, and in his presence. Elder Milinos of Simon Obedra gives us an image of the Jesus prayer. The name of Jesus, the wedding prayer, says the Holy Fathers, say the Holy Fathers, is a flask of myrrh. The name of Jesus, the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ have mercy me, is a flask of myrrh. You open it, you tilt it, and the myrrh pours out, filling the room with fragrance. You cry out, Lord Jesus Christ, and the fragrance of the Holy Spirit exudes from all the senses and from every cell of your body. You receive the dowry of the divine spirit. The dowry meaning the fruit of the, uh, I mean, the, how can we unpack the dowry? I don't know if people, we don't have dowries anymore. People know, <laughs> not everybody knows what a dowry is. Uh, you receive the dowry of the divine spirit. It's like the uh, that which has been prepared and gathered and given. Now is given to the, the one who is an inheritor. I love this. The fragrance of the Holy Spirit exudes from all the senses from every cell of your body. Think about this: the soul and the body are coterminous. Every cell in your body has your soul. And so when the soul is sanctified, when the soul is filled with the fragrance of the Holy Spirit, the whole body, every cell is filled with the fragrance uh, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
St. Sophronius of Essex says, stay with the prayer. Keep struggling, and you will pass the day without sin. Everything else will be given from God himself. As we talked about and we've said many times, we give all the zeros, many, many, many zeros, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy, all of our zeros, right? We've, here we are. And then the one comes, God himself, and he makes it all valuable. He gives it all to us as a gift. Gives it all back to us, right? In return, all the love that we give, he gives back to us a hundredfold, his love. Those who pray without ceasing are blessed. St. Epaisu the other night says, Blessed are those who have Christ in their hearts as their axis and joyfully revolve around his holy name, noetically and without ceasing. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy me. Prayer is the most important thing. St. Ephraim of Kathanaki, all the Holy Fathers cry out that the most important thing in, in, in the life of every Christian is prayer. Do you want to put your life in order? Pray. Do you want to be saved? Pray. All prayers are good and holy, but noetic prayer is the queen of them. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. From this little but all-powerful prayer, the Holy Fathers were set in motion and became shining stars of the church. Say this little prayer unceasingly, as much as you can, day and night, and it will teach you, it will teach you, it will teach you, that that, that, that which you desire, that which you do not know. Interesting, huh? You desire it, but you do not know. Do you know that? Do you know there are things that you don't know, but you desire, but you don't know that you desire it, and you long for it, but you don't know? Because you have not yet experienced of it, but that's what your soul is longing for. It's God, of course. Get going with this little prayer. Get on with it. There you go. All right, let's open it up to questions now. Let's open up to questions. I think we've come to our, the end. Let me just give you the uh, the final page here. And look forward to your questions. Let's see what we got. There we go. So we got 10 questions. Thank God. It's wonderful. So let's start with the questions. Father Peter, your blessing. Welcome back safely home to you and your family. I hope your conference was spiritually fruitful for all. I have begun with the Jesus Prayer, 33 recitations, as you suggested. You mentioned during one of your lectures in the past weeks, the prayer rope to say an additional special prayer to the Most Holy Theotokos using the prayer rope. Would you tell us that again, please? Further, may we use the prayer rope to repeat the Lord's Prayer in devotions? Thank you. All right, Mary. Thank you for your question, Mary. All right. Um, so first and foremost, very good that you began. It's very good that you began saying the Jesus prayer. Um, the prayer to the mother of God, of course, is most holy Theotokos save us. Most holy Theotokos save us. And let me actually put this on the screen for you. I think that would be the best way to do that. Um, most holy Theotokos, save us. You could also say most holy mother of God, save us. But you know what? The Theotokos is probably preferable because it's a dogmatic term used by the ecumenical councils to describe the birth giver of God. That's what it means. Or mother of God. Uh, you could also say all holy, which is panagia in Greek. Right? So that's the that's the uh, phrase. Most holy Theotokos save us. Most holy mother of God save us. All holy mother of God save us. But uh, hyperagia is the Greek. And that's all uh, most holy or more than holy, really. More more holy, uh, but it doesn't really translate in uh, in English very well. All right, so then um, to use the prayer rope to say the Lord's Prayer. It's not really something that I've seen done or heard done, but I'm, I mean, you can do that, but I, I wouldn't say that that's a practice that I've seen done widely. 
Uh, now, in the ancient church, they would they would read the Psalter continually in the desert of, of Egypt. And the Lord's Prayer has been used um, occasionally. I don't really think it's been something that's been done repetitively, uh, you know, on and on and on. So the, the Jesus Prayer really has become and it has been for really since the desert of Egypt the go-to prayer which allows someone to focus and uh and 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 safe stay focused on the lord but you can certainly say the, the lord's prayer many times it's certainly fine olga has a question what are some practical ways to pray at night during the work week splash water on face drink water etc uh, so you're talking about how to get up. What's the practical ways to get up and, and get out of your your uh, drowsiness? Is that what you want to ask? I'm not really sure what the question is. But if that's what you're asking, I mean, you know, people do different things. It's not really one thing, but certainly uh, you want to, you know, do whatever you need to do to get out of the bed. That's the first step. And that's hard sometimes. Uh, you want to have a rhythm and a, and, a, and, a, and a program there. So some people, for instance, just give you an example. Some people will say that when I get out of the bed, I'm going to go right to the prayer corner, make a prostration, say the Jesus prayer once, uh, maybe say morning prayer immediately, I don't know. Uh, and then I'm going to go and I'm going to wash my face, I'm going to brush my teeth, I'm going to go to the restroom, whatever. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, some people say I'm going to start the prayer immediately, I'm going to start the morning prayer. Some, some people say I'm going to go get a coffee. I've seen, I've been in monasteries where the, uh, some monks got a blessing, they go and they drink a coffee, they wake up with the coffee. You know, they're getting up at 11 at night and they're doing divine liturgy at six in the morning. So they got a six, seven hour window and they're blessed by their elder to drink a cup of coffee for the vigil. And then uh, they might sit and read a spiritual work uh, for a bit and then they begin their prayer rule. Uh, so it, there's no real like you have to do X one or the other, but that's a typical process. Many people uh, I find do the prostrations first that helps them to wake up, get the blood flowing. So if they have 10 or 20 or 100 prostrations or whatever it is, depending on their spiritual struggle, they they will uh, they will do those prostrations for the most part to begin the whole uh, prayer rule. Some people split it up into two or three parts. That's fine, too. You know, there's not like a you have to do X one one or the other. And you work with your spiritual father and you figure out a program and you stick to it. That's the key. Uh, Vasiliki has a question. Father Bless, in the book, the, the prayer rope, the prayer to the Theotokos is different. It starts, Rejoice, Mary, thou art full of grace, and continues. What is the name of this prayer, and can we in exchange this with Most Holy Theotokos save us? Um, it's said often, but it's not interchanged usually in my experience with uh, Most Holy Theotokos save us because of the shortness of the Most Holy Theotokos save us. You're talking about uh the, what the prayer we say at the end of compline it sounds like although the translation is a little different that i'm familiar with uh rejoice me, uh, rejoice talk, rejoice mary full of grace the lord is with you blessed are thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thou from the savior of our souls that's the prayer you're talking about it said it Three times at the end of Compline, usually, at least in the Athenite tradition. Uh, that's not normally uh, said instead of Most Holy Theotokos save us. And you ask also in each Jesus prayer accompanied by doing the sign of the cross. Thank you uh, for all you do, Father. Okay, so the, the it is customary, uh, not everywhere in the Orthodox Church, but certainly on Monathos, that they'll do a set of prayers in the beginning so like one prayer rule for that I've seen for a beginner monk would be uh, like a novice would be something like this. They would do, and this is not for everybody, obviously, this is for a novice and monathos, but just to give you a sense, they'll begin their prayer rule with the sign of the cross, making the sign of the cross with each Jesus prayer. And they'll do that maybe three times three or three times four and the 300 times four, right? So they'll do maybe 300 times three with the, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And they'll do that three prayer ropes of 300. And then they'll do whatever, another three prayer ropes of 300 to Christ without the sign of the cross. And then they'll do 
the analogous to the Theotokos. That might be a prayer rule for a beginner, uh, you know, novice or somebody who's just starting out. I don't know. So the Jesus prayer with the sign of the cross is done in the beginning, usually of the prayer rule, to get you focused, to help you to focus and to wake you up and all the rest. Georgia sounds like Georgia is from Georgia is from Greece with the mat, with the um, symbol she has there. Is it useful to tell the evil one out loud to leave? I remember in Bible Christ says, "Get thee behind me, Satan." So wondering if it's helpful to do so, or should we ignore and never address out loud? Um, it's fine to do that. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but I tend to think that the um, more experienced is going to show no signs of uh, what their internal life is, is about. Ultimately, I think the experienced spiritual struggle struggler is going to have a poker face with regard to the demons and uh, human beings generally. Like they're gonna, there's going to be a almost constant sobriety and 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 peace and 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 they're not going to be super excited or super upset ever that's the tranquility and the passionlessness they're going to arrive at and so that's going to be reflected on their face and in their emotions and in their in their uh, struggle um i think that's preferable but it, it of course the lord um and gave us that example get behind me saying he said to peter um but um Maybe if you're really struggling, you should do that. But maybe you need to do it noetically more often than not. And that, that certainly uh, is going to be as effective. I mean, we don't need to verbalize in the spiritual struggle. It's not, not as necessary uh, as, as you might think. It's, it's the prayer and the presence of the prayer is communicated to the demons they understand very well if someone is praying fervently but I don't, it's not like you can you can do it sure but i don't think it's the practice of an experienced warrior from an inquirer who grew up in pentecostalism father bless what would you say to those who would say the prayer to the theotokos to save us is saying the orthodox are like catholics and say mary plays a part in saving someone. Well, I just put a video on online, Tom. I don't know if you saw that. Let me, oops, sorry about that. Let me actually, let me actually bring it up, uh, and you can watch it. How's that sound? And then we can talk about it. I don't know if you missed it that we just put it on. And let me find it. It's um, here, I think. No. Post my video. Where is it? There it is. All right. So let's um, let me get it up here, and then we can watch it real quick. It's one minute, and you can um, hear what I have to say about that, and then we can talk about it. You ready? There it is. Let me get out of here. Oh, something we want. There we go. Prayers, if any, that I know of that say to the mother of God, have mercy on me, because that's almost always understood as the grace of God, the mercy of God that's visited to us. We do say save me, and we mean it both temporally and eternally. We don't mean that she is the savior, but we mean that by her prayers and by her intercessions and by her help, she will sa help save us, be instrumental in our salvation. She's already been instrumental in everyone's salvation through her yes to the archangel, through her love, through her purity, through her struggle, through her prayers. Everything about her life is instrumental for everyone's salvation. So we are already being saved in part by her contribution. And that's the synergy of God and man. That's what it means the incarnation. So we say, save me both, save me from imminent temporal harm by your prayers and save me from eternal separation by your prayers. Always by her intercessions, her care for us and her great boldness 
before God. All right, so you can see that the Orthodox Church has no problem in saying, save me, because we don't understand um, the salvation uh, in Christ to be, uh, to, to, the mother of God doesn't have, have no part in it. She plays a part in it. And that's obvious from the incarnation. Uh, she is the link between God and man. Her purity, her faithfulness it was what the whole preparation of the Old Testament was to prepare the people of God to bring forth the mother of God. And for her, therefore, to be able to be the conduit and the vehicle and the the uh, untrodden portal of God that comes into this world. So she's already, whether they like it or not, an intercessor. She is the uh, great uh, uh, link between God and man. Without her, there would be no incarnation. Uh, so she continues to play that role in heaven because she's alive. And we believe in the Orthodox Church. We have witnessed from the earliest days that her body was not left in the grave, but the first fruits of the resurrection through her she died, but she was then, after three days, resurrected, and her body was ascended, and and uh, in, in, it sits at the right hand of Christ, her son. So she is the only human being, uh, not theanthropos like Christ, but just human being who sits in heaven already in, in heaven. So that is the teaching of the church for 2,000 years from the beginning that he did not leave her his flesh and you know, the flesh that he got from her he did not leave her his own mother in the grave to see corruption uh, but she is the first fruit so it absolutely she plays a huge role in our salvation not only again um in terms of her intercessions and her prayers and her boldness before god uh but and this is God's desire. God desires this. This is very clear from church history that he's, he wants the participation of all of his saints and all the human beings. He wants them to play a role in the salvation of the world. He desires it. He brings it about. And this is a clear in Scripture. It, the Lord was accused by the Pharisees when he said that um, it was so bold to say that he would forgive the sins of the of the man. Uh, and he says, well, if you want to see that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, then he raises him from his bed. And then he turns to the apostles and disciples and says, that power that they said only God had, that I have as theanthropos, I'm going to give to you, human beings, that are not theanthropy, they're not God-men, they're just God, they're men who are becoming gods by grace through the presence of the Spirit of God. Now he gives them that power which belongs only to God. He desires that the, that the church and the human beings and all of the saints participate directly in the salvation of the world. The Protestant vi uh, vision of things is so distorted by the rejection of Rome and the distortions of Rome, they cannot get out of that paradigm. It's a tragedy. They need to get out of that paradigm and rethink things and start over because the idea that the, that the saints and the mother of God are irrelevant or not a part of our salvation is very mistaken. And God has shown again and again that he desires that. And through their prayers in this life and in the next, he is the God of the living, not the dead, says in the Old, the Old Testament. They don't, we don't die as Christians. We just are transported to eternal life. We don't die in the sense of the spirit and the soul of man dying, right? And and yes, the body is separated from the soul, obviously, but we, we have already uh, been passed over from death to life in terms of our spiritual communion with God. And so they continue to live and they continue to intercede and they continue to play a role in the salvation. We are all, all of us, the heavenly and the earthly church is one in Christ. And we all help one another on the path of salvation. We bear one another's burdens. We intercede for one another. This is the beauty of the church. Of salvation. It's now. It's not something in the future. He brought salvation and eternal life in this world now in his person, in the body of Christ, and in all the saints who have lived this to the to the uh, the highest, the fullest. So um, it, you have to get out of the anti-papal reactionary stance of the Protestants, put it all aside, start over, rethink it, 
and and go back to the long history of the patristic literature for going back thousands of years. You've got people like St. Maximus the Confessor writing a whole treatise on the Mother of God. This is not something that happened anywhere in the second millennium. It's far, far removed from papalism and their distortions. So um, I don't know if that helped. Hopefully, Tom, that helped. Let me see our comments because I'm not seeing comments anymore. Is that helpful, Tom? One of the bad things about this new interface on Crowdcast is you, I can't see the question. If I see the questions, I can't see the comments where I used to be able to see both. All right. So hopefully that helped uh, our brother Tom. I don't see him uh, commenting. So let me go back now to the questions. We got George. George, is there a set number of frustrations that we do we do daily? So by my father confessed that the general number for daily frustrations is 36. Never heard of that. So that is what I've been doing for the last year or so. Is this true? And if so, do you know where that rule stems from? I never heard of that, George. Why would 36 be the number? I've never heard of that. Um, you know, I've heard, again, my experience is with on Athos and with uh, some of the fathers there and as a novice, I mean, I stayed on Athos for a while and kind of got the, uh, a little sense of what they're, what the uh, beginners are, are doing on Athos, and they were doing 150 prostrations a night at least. Some, some did 100, others 200, but I'd say 150. I don't know where he gets the number 36. It doesn't matter. The number doesn't matter. Whatever he gives you, do. Uh, you can always ask for more. If you think you can do more and you want to do more, that's perfectly acceptable. And then he'll tell you whether he thinks you can do it and should do it. But uh, never never heard of 36 being any particular magical number for prostrations. So, so not a huge issue, though. Maria Spanos, bless Father, the Lord bless you, Maria. In the first couple of minutes of the class, you specifically mentioned about going to the movies and how that is detrimental to our spiritual life. Can you explain more about that? What if our family watches TV movies, even if we go to church and are prayerful? Does this apply to playing sports? Is doing these things even once in a while detrimental to our spiritual life? And how do we help our family members want to stop doing them, particularly if we have already, if we've allowed and encouraged it up to this point? So, Maria, it is true. I mean, in the monastic life, in the ascetic life, among spiritual seekers, I think it would be universally seen that these distractions aren't going to help their spiritual life. I don't think it's a controversial, what I'm saying. Having said that, the question of, 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 of uh, raising children and all of that which it entails uh, and the pedagogy that might be uh, involved there in this day and age in this society uh, is going to mitigate or, 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 or what's the word, um, is going to create pastoral or pedagogical cases where you're going to be more lax. You cannot impose that um, across the board and undiscerningly to every member of your family. And now, if you've already been doing that, you're going to movies together, you're going, you know, whatever. And I think there's a, it's a spectrum. I don't think everything is as bad as other things. I mean, we, we have certainly watched movies in our lifetime in our family. We don't have a television. But occasionally, if we think something's really beneficial to the soul, we, we, we sit down and either watch it or allow them to watch it. But I, I don't think it's hugely beneficial. But I think pedagogically, there's times when you're going to do that. I mean, St. Anthony sat down and, 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 and was very... Um, what was he doing? The story is very didactic. He says, I, can't, I forget the activity, but they were doing something that wasn't very monastic. And he was, one of the monks was scandalized and said, St. Anthony, why are you doing this with the monks? I think it was just chatting or, but it was nothing all that, but it was something that they don't normally do. And, and he was kind of scandalized. And St. Anthony family said, you know, you, if you pull the string too many times, you're going to break it. You've got to uh, allow, uh, that you know downtime essentially is what he's saying you've got to allow down so there's there's depending on the soul of the child depending on what's happening you're going to have you're going to have a it's going to be a process to move away from that or you're going to be a process of how to utilize it 
at, at different times. The key is that in the hierarchy of things is not lost in the mind of the fate of the children or of the family members, that they understand that these things are of this world and they're temporal and, and always for them to focus on what am I getting out of this? Why am I doing this? Okay. Maybe reading this book, watching this movie is beneficial for a particular thing. What is it? That's what it is. Okay. Nothing more. It's not like this is life. I, I read, you know, I, whatever the, series of books, uh, Little House on the Prairie to the kids or something. I mean, there's plenty they need to learn in that book. It's a kind of, you can watch Little House on the Prairie videos or you can watch, watch, you know read the books. They need to do that. They need to go through that process. It's important. It's, it's necessary. As long as you understand this is just learning about that and that in the hierarchy of things, this is pretty minor. And you've got to always keep that in, in perspective and so they don't lose sight of what, what are we doing here? Why am I doing this, right? I think that's key. Uh, and you can have downtime and you can go, you know, and do things that are not directly spiritually related. I think that's important. They, they develop the whole person. It's all fine. But in the hierarchy of things and and not to the detriment uh, uh, of everything, not not to do it, you know, every every day or five times a week or two times a week. And you're, you know, oh, we got, and then they they live for the movies or something. Because well, all week my, I can't see a movie, but Sunday I'm going to see a movie, and then they live for it. If you see that kind of thing, then you've probably gone off the, the if you're imbalanced. You're imbalanced, and you've got to correct. But that, if you've done it for a long time, it's going to be a process of correcting. It's not going to be something overnight, right? And you first and foremost have to set the example. You first and foremost have to live the prayer, and 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 your prayer and your example. It may take time for them to say, you know what. Yeah, I like movies, but I like the prayer far more and what it brings to me. And and then they're going to leave it on their own. If you try now without the prayer, the depth, the sweetness, to impose restrictions, you're not going to watch this because it's not spiritual. Ain't gonna, it's not going to go anywhere. Right? It's not going to go anywhere. Nine times out of ten, it's not going to go anywhere. And they're just going to rebel. So you need to be very wise in how you're going to pedagogically, you know, reorient the ship of the family it's going to take time if you've gone over you know excessively or or whatever uh but i I'm not, i don't again i don't say it's like off the table but it's got to be in its place and understood in such a way uh, it's hard to raise children today you've got a tightrope all right uh justin has a question from jf on telegram what is a good practice for beginners on saying the Jesus prayer mentally while out in the world, work errands, walking. Should we attempt constant forcing of this mentally? Yeah, we just talked about this. It's in the it's in the lives of the saints. I mean, the words of the saints that we just quoted. That it is a struggle all throughout the day to say the Jesus prayer. Now, it's going to be hard. And it, and if you don't do it as a rule in the morning before you go out into the world, you're probably not going to have much success throughout the day. Uh, you need to both. And you, first and foremost, you need to have that in in the morning as a prayer rule. Uh, that's the most important thing. Uh, and then throughout the day, as much as you can, uh, force yourself to return to the prayer. The more you do it, the more it's going to come be sweet, the more it's going to draw you in, the more you're going to desire it and not the distractions. And, you know, insofar as we're guilty of distractions, all of us, including myself, we're not making as much progress. That's just the way it is. You can't, can't have everything, right? You got to choose what you want. With your blessing, Father, I would like to ask two more questions. This is from George. Um, I was recently visiting a family member in the hospital. As I was leaving, I came across a woman in need, and I happened to have my gold biscuit in my pocket, so I gave it to her. I now need to purchase a new one, but won't be visiting a monastery to the end of the summer. Do you have any recommendations on where I should purchase my next one? Not really. There's a lot of places you can buy them. Uh, St. Paisius Monastery in Arizona, St. Paisius Monastery, the Serbian Monastery, a women monastery, I think they make prayer robes. Uh, I think St. Anthony's has prayer robes. You can buy them there. Secondly, a few months ago, you stated that you may be possibly being a, doing a talk in Pennsylvania. Is there a set date for your Pennsylvania visit yet? I would love to drive up from Baltimore and attend. I greatly appreciate all your time and hard work yeah no we don't have a day yet and i haven't been back in touch with that person but i i understand that they still want to do it so i will definitely announce it when it happens but it probably won't be for several months 
it, it, it looks like to me. All right. Um, summertime is not the highest time for visiting parishes in my experience. Uh, let's see. This is Stephen. What does it mean to hold a thought and let it descend into the heart? Is there a way to think of this that would allow us to get our mind around it enough to practice it? No, I think you have to experience it and you have to just slowly, it, it, it's something that comes as a fruit of forcing and struggling and patience in the prayer. It's not something you can like think of and then happen. It's not a, it's not a trick with your mind, right? It's a fruit of love and prayer and it comes, it comes naturally. So uh, you'll, you'll know it when you see it more or less. Uh, he's trying to describe this reality that he lived but if we don't live the reality, uh, it, we can only speculate ultimately. But it, it is a fruit of of the prayer and the and the concentration on the prayer and the patience in that prayer, and eventually your spirit, your heart, the eye of your soul, the news it, 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 it is is in the depth of your being is crying out to God, and you're you're not praying just. At like I'm speaking right now, putting words together and saying them. That's not the prayer is not on that level anymore. It's on a deeper level in the heart of man. All right. So that's we can describe it, but we've got to struggle to live it to understand it. Where can I find the PDF? I cannot locate on, on Patreon. Which PDF are you talking about, Andrew? I'm not sure which PDF you're talking about. The one we just did, it'll be uploaded soon. The one from previous week, whatever I didn't upload, I'll upload tonight. So I'm not really sure what PDF you're talking about. If I've if I've not if I've neglected to upload any from previous lectures, I'll try to do that tonight with this one. Whenever I get off. Question: Do we say this is from Mel on Telegram? Do we say anything if we see a Catholic wearing a kombiskini? Who wears it as a Greek bracelet? How would you confront this? Well, I would just encourage him to. Uh, you know, use it properly and and be serious. Uh, and and maybe if he starts to actually pray, God will uh, you know draw him into the into the church. But he won't be able to systematically do much outside the church. He'll probably do whatever he can here and there. But it's going to be very hard for somebody outside the church to develop a, a serious uh, prayer rule without a spiritual father and without the grace of God and the mysteries. Everything we talked about that is presupposed. To make progress in the spiritual life is not going to happen. So, yeah, let him, let him, you know, encourage him to pray, and maybe he'll get interested in orthodoxy. Can saying the Jesus prayer to be uh, be like putting up an antenna for the demons to come and attack us? Well, being a Christian and saying the any all the prayers is like that, and the Jesus prayer is even more so. Certainly, they're going to attack those who make progress. So, God willing, will be attacked. Uh, Mary, is it uh, okay to do either the Lord's Prayer or a uh, short prayer to the Theodokos at each round as you reach the cross on the rope? I think we already answered this. Maybe it's, is there asked again? I'm not sure. Or is it better to keep an unedited phrase of the of the Jesus Prayer? Yeah, you just like we talked about, what the saints talked about tonight. What, what did they say? What did St. Paisu say? 300, he was talking about the rule that for the monks, 300, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, times times three. 100 times three, uh, 300, I'm sorry, 100, one times 300, rather, uh, to the mother of God. In other words, three to one, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, most holy Theotoko, save us. It's better to keep focused than to break it up and to say long prayers. And, and you know, for there's no real, I don't, I've never seen anybody say, go and say the Lord's Prayer 100 times. Never heard that. Uh, most holy Theotoko is three to one, right? One to every three of Christ. Question from Kelly. Father Bless, I received this email from my priest below. I don't have a good feeling about this book you recommended. This is a good prayer book. And what are the official prayer of the church? Thank you, Kelly Steiner from Hawaii. I recommend this book by Sister Vasa Larin, Praying in Time. I don't know the book, so I can't really speak to the book, but Sister Vasa has unfortunately made a lot of errors and done things that are clearly uh, not uh, according to the orthodox phronema and dogma with regard to the, to the papal, papal protestants so i would not read a book by sister vasa unfortunately 
it's too bad. Um, no, I don't even know what the book is though, but I, unfortunately the, the writer there is not following the narrow path. Too often people get these, you go on, too often we get these prayer books from this or that monastery. Those are full of lovely, oh, this is the priest talking. I'm sorry, he's talking, he's writing to you. Those are full of lovely prayers that came into vogue in the 1600s in Europe and replaced the Liturgy of the Hours for Lady. Who is this priest that's writing? They contain things like an Akathist prep for Holy Communion and lots of clergy encourage their parishioners and spiritual children to use them, which is fine, but they're not the official prayer of the church. Rather, simple collections of prayers. They aren't meant to supplant the Liturgy of the Hours, but to augment it. Interesting. Um, sorry, I didn't hit the uh, answering button. Um, so Sister Voss is going back to the Western practice, and, and it sounds like she's adopting that. And, and yes, the, there is, of course, the hours that are prayed in church. Uh, but the, the idea that the prayer books that have come down to us are not the prayers of the church, no. Those things are all the prayers of the church, the fruit of the church. This is a problem. It's a Protestant-like conception that we're going to go back and rework tradition. We're going to we're going to go back and take a better, make a better version of it, go back before. If you're not receiving holy orthodoxy, the life of the faith from the saints of our day and the previous generations, you're not receiving holy orthodoxy. You're making it up. And you can, if you go back and you say, oh, I, I prefer the prayers from the 14th century, and I want to use the uh, text of the liturgy from the 13th century, and I want to use the text of Vespers from the 11th century, this is a Protestant approach to life in Christ. We don't do that. We've never done that. People become disciples of contemporary living saints and tradition, and they follow them. And that's what God, God the Holy Spirit has arranged this for us. And if you doubt that and you don't want to be a disciple, you're you're following your own your own will and your own ideas. And you're going outside of the will of God. It's very clear. You don't if Saint Paisios, Saint Porfirio, Saint Jacobo, Saint Gabriel, Saint Justin, Saint Joseph, and on and on and on became holy, God bearing elders and wonder workers and clairvoyant with the prayers that the church has given us and gives us, and mainly the Jesus prayer, you can too. And the fact that you think, I mean, the priest or Sister Vasa thinks that they need to go back and rediscover and read and re and find the true prayers of the church because these are, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. You know, they might be great academics and they figured it out, but that's not how the church works. It's not how the church works. So I would not listen to that suggestion. You can certainly go and buy the book if you really want to. I'm not going to tell you not to do that. You might even go and do the, hour, the prayers of the hours, like, like he says. That's fine. But if you think that that is the only way or the best way or the only prayers of the church or that you need to do that but and the other things are innovations or whatever, that's delusional. Right? That's problematic. It's delusional. Uh, this is the problem. Who is Sister Vasa's spiritual father? Who is this priest spiritual father? Who were they saints? Were they elders? Were they God-bearing elders? Did they have? Why should we listen to anybody? Why should you listen to me? Don't listen to me. The saints of our day, do they tell you to go throw out the prayer book or not use it or put it aside? I mean, I don't want to paint him as being extreme. I mean, he's not. But I mean, that's the whole approach is problematic. The living tradition that come down to us today through the prayers of our Holy Fathers who are living, not the ones, not just the ones who've reposed, but the, first and foremost, the ones who are alive. That's what God has given us, and we need to be following their example. And they, they've become saints, so we don't need to rethink things. We need to say the Jesus Prayer. All right. Father Peter, I hope your travels went well. A special thank you for the evening teaching. This information is not delivered in church. We are not blessed with this very important information to help us on our salvation rather than live in darkness. Thankfully, you uh, are blessed to teach us through. Thank you. God bless you, sunshine from Australia. Two more questions, unless we've got other questions. I've got two more to go, and then we'll call it a night. Do you do we say anything to our fellow Orthodox Christians that are converts who are using a Catholic rosary to say the Jesus prayer? 
Is there a problem with using that? Yes, of course there is. We don't use Catholic rosaries. They're not a part of the Orthodox tradition. That's a uh, very late Western practice that you don't find saints doing and using. Why are they doing that? I just got done talking about how they need to follow the saints of today, follow the elders, just only for the sake, if it was only for the sake, Maria, that they were being obedient and humble to that which was given and handed down to us today, that's enough. That's enough to put the rosary away, all right? There's a, there's a little bit of pride in using the rosary because St. Paisios, Elder Ephraim, and all the rest did not use the rosary. Why are you using it? Who told you to use it? Why are you being disobedient and not following examples of the saints? I don't get it. So that alone, all the rest, well, it's the same thing. Well, it speeds to, well, 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 well. That's not the point, and that's secondary. Why are you doing it? Who told you to do it? Why are you doing it? That's the question, and there's no good reason. Follow the saints and be humble. When I see people ignoring the saints or attacking the saints, like we saw a while back with some particular old calendars who are in delusion, when they attack the saints or they ignore the saints, it's the same thing. They might as well walk according to their will and their and their their mind and their you know according to their desires of their hearts and God help them. Uh, the consensus of the saints of our day, the last hundred years, whatever you want to say, is the key. And that's who God has given us to guide us. And we need to be their disciples. Uh, Father, let's see. Uh, Carla says, Father, can it be said that there is no consolation in this world? Uh, no consolation from this world? Yes. No consolation in this world? No. We are in the world, but not of it. We have consolation in this world because we are in Christ at the same time. Not, so if you want to say from this world, Carla, yes. This world meaning the passions, the fallenness the mindlessness, the atheism, there's not going to be any consolation from that. It's only going to be a fake, false, pseudo-consolation from the passions that are temporary and then bring greater guilt and and uh, pain and suffering in their wake. Uh, so that of this world, there's no true consolation, only in God, only in the Spirit of God, only in a communion with God will people find true and lasting Consolation. Despina has a question. Father, bless any comment on the material of the Combeschini. I heard back and heard black in color and will. Hmm. Tassel is added for tears of compunction. Thank you. Um, I I don't know. I don't know what you're asking exactly. It's a bit it's a bit confusing to me the question. But you're asking me to comment on the actual Combeschini and the symbolism is what you're probably getting to, right? And I and I am not really prepared to say much, so I don't know. If you what? Oh, okay, in wool, I see you just changed it. Um, I heard black in color. I heard. I heard. Is it what is it? What do you mean by that? Uh, I see. You want me? Well, tassels added for tears of compunction. Yeah, whatever it is, it's symbolism. I don't know. I haven't studied it, frankly. It sounds kind of like, why haven't I studied it? Well, I kind of just want to focus on the prayer, but I've not sat down and said, well, I wonder what all this symbolism is. So I'm sorry. I don't have an answer for that. All right. I don't see any other questions. What's the hand symbol for? What are you talking about? What hand symbol? There you go. Justin Justin says, Father Seraphim used to encourage pilgrims to once a year watch the 1951 version of Christmas Carol. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is where we're at. Like, we pedagogically, we're still babes. We need to just get back to being kind of simple <laughs> human beings before we can become holy human beings. That's the idea behind his pedagogy. And he's, he's got, you know, we were in a, we're still in a time of tremendous delusion and, and fakery. And so... You know, we've got to get out of that before we can talk about a serious. I mean, it's not like one or the other, but we definitely have to have that if we're if we're meshed in the world and it's fakery and delusion, then we need to deal with that. I think it's Father Seraphim's 
approach. Despy says wool materially is wool black is the color to pick. Yeah. I mean, if that's what you're asking, if that's what you're saying, yeah, the best uh, and the most traditional, of course, of the prayer ropes is going to be wool with black. That's that's customary. Yeah. There are other wonderful materials that's used. I don't think it's a huge issue, but that is uh, the traditional prayer rope. The priests at the church allow what, Maria? They will allow people to use the rosary to do the Jesus prayer? Is that what you're saying? They allow the priests the priest say it's okay to use a rosary to say the Jesus prayer. Why would you want a rosary to say Jesus prayer? It's not meant for that. It's meant for the prayers of the rosary. I don't get it. It's not the same numbers. People, that, I don't, why would you do that? They don't use the prayer rope to do their rosary. Why do we use the rosary to do our prayer rope? I don't get it. To do our prayer, prayer rule. Somebody help me. What am I missing here? Yeah, I think black is the is the 99% of the time is black, but it's not it's not like it's a sinful thing to use another color. Just not tra very traditional. It's not something they did usually. There's probably different reasons why that. What's important is they're praying. That's the important thing. I don't get hung up on these kind of things personally. All right, if Maria doesn't have anything to tell me about the priest and their use of rosaries for prayer rules, I guess I've answered all the questions tonight. Now, this Thursday, uh, or rather next Thursday, uh, is uh, this Thursday will be with you all. Right, because it's the 22nd, but next Thursday is the 29th, the evening of the 29th, and I will have to uh move it to Friday. 99% sure next Thursday will not happen. The question and answer session, and we'll move it to Friday because Thursday uh we'll have an event here, so I won't be able to have a third next Thursday, not tomorrow, not two days from now, in in. In nine days or ten days, we will not have it on Thursday. We'll have it on Friday. But in two days, we'll have a regular question and answer session. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you then. Shall we do a poll? Do you want me to keep going on the Jesus prayer and 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 do a study? It'll probably take me about three weeks to four weeks to go through this with you all. Why don't we get a uh, poll going here before we hang out? We got 67 people with us hanging on with us on the East Coast there. Good time to go to bed. Um, let, let me get your thoughts. Uh, the poll is, is this been, has this been good? You want me to keep going and finish up the book? It'll be a th two to three more weeks uh, for uh, on the Jesus prayer. I'm going to keep going. What do you want me to go off into other topics? Probably finish up the rest of June. Um, uh, all right, so I'm putting up a poll right here. And there it is. All right, so check out the poll and let me know your thoughts. Uh, keep going. June 29th, no session. Uh, all right. Cindy wants to keep going in the Jesus prayer. Tamara says yes. Sotiria says yes. Carla says yes. Alexandra Vasiliki. Uh, go over there and take the poll. And let me know your thoughts. All right, folks. Well, we've got next week, if we do it, on the Jesus prayer next week, we're going to cover the first stages of prayer. And then we'll go on to the method and the stages of prayer after that. The manner and the pursuits, uh, the later stages of prayer. And then the final one will be the advanced stages of prayer. Prayer for the living and the deceased. 
the method of prayer when addressed to the Holy Mother of the and to the saints and for the deceased. This is all based on Saint Paisios's uh, writings, uh, which is a little bit different than others, like Elder Ephrem. So it'll be it'll be uh, I think very interesting for those who have been exposed to Elder Ephrem uh, and and his, his writings. It'll be a little bit different, uh, not much, very similar, but slightly different. So the poll is. 96% want me to continue on with the prayer. Talk about the prayer of Jesus. 96% tonight. Nico, can't do polls on new Crowdcast mobile app. That's too bad, Nico. What's your vote? Are you in favor? Nico, let us know. Alexandra says she was able to. You want more Jesus prayer. All right. Keep going, please. Angelica, Paisios, Melicha. All right. Everybody's in favor of me to keep going, it looks like. And we have Michael saying he likes the spiritual lessons the best. Okay. I think that's true for everybody, I hope. Uh, we do the other stuff because we have to and important for the church and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? But the spiritual life is, the, of course, the center of it all. Hannah wants the differences between Byzantine Rite Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox Church. Are they the same? You want me to do a, a podcast on that? That would be something that would be interesting. But are you just asking me to say something right now? Hannah. Hannah Hong. Hannah Hong. Hong is an interesting name. Is, are you from the middle, uh, the East, the Asian, uh, from Asia? Is Hong a, an Asian name or is that just a shortened Nico says, more Jesus prayer. Always more, more. Okay. Android. Uh, maybe you're on Android. I don't know. All right. Any other thoughts before we hang up? The poll is conclusive. 97%. Only one person said, let's not do the Jesus prayer. I'm sorry for that one person. Hopefully you'll stay with us. We'll keep going. All right, folks. Let me see what else, any announcements before we hang up. So I just want to share with you, for you diehards who are still around, we've been here two and a half hours. You're a very patient group. Unfortunately, Soteria, not a lot of priests talk about the Jesus Prayer, which is unbelievable to me. We should talk about it more. I should talk about it more. Asian name. I like that. Are you asking me, Hana, to talk now about the difference between the Uniates and the Orthodox, or do you want me to do a podcast on it? Joachim is from Korea. That's true. But you don't live in Korea now, do you? Joachim, are you still in Korea? I always get, I'm very confused on where people are. People write me from all over the world, so I, I get confused. But you're in the United States, aren't you now? Yes. Uh, now I'm thinking more and more. Yes, my brain is functioning. Uh, yes, Eastern Rite slash Uniates are wolf and sheep's clothing. That's that's true. But I'm still waiting for Hannah to tell me if she wants me to do a podcast on it or just say something right now. I did. She can help me. That would be helpful. So we are meeting on Thursday, Vasiliki. We are not. We are meeting on Tuesday. We're not meeting on next Thursday in 10 days, but on Friday. 29th, no lesson. You're in Texas. I knew you were, Joachim. I'm sorry. You just threw me there for a minute. You said I'm from Korea, and I thought, did I miss something? I don't know where Hana went. Are you going to tell me, Hana? you want me to talk about that right now? Or do you just want me to do a podcast on it? I'd like love to hear more uh what you need i want to give you what you need all right so good night paisus and maria i think we're gonna we're okay right this minute well i, I can't say much but i'll give you two words and then we're gonna hang up but before we do that i want to make an announcement so we had uh very successful lectures and uh in um i would I, I mean they were well received in uh, Alabama, I want to tell you about that. They're gonna some of that's gonna be put on in the near future. Look for it. 
Uh, and we also had a lot of very good meetings and people on the road. I stopped in Texas and met with people. I talked in New Mexico. I stopped. I stopped in South Carolina, in Tennessee. It was quite a trip. Uh, can't get into it now, but thank you for your patience and, you know, not being around much uh, with you the last two weeks. Now, uh, Hannah, the the origins and development of the so-called Eastern Rite Catholics, also called Unions in the East, uh, is, is uh, basically during a time when there was a lot of missionary activity and attempts to bring the Orthodox back under the Pope. And there were pieces of the Orthodox around the world, but mainly in the Middle East, some pieces, and then Eastern Europe that were broken off from the Orthodox Church and came under the Pope. And they, they created what was essentially an external form, very much like the Orthodox in terms of the divine liturgy and the rites. But in a spiritual sense, in the, in really following the teachings of the of the Holy Fathers, and living out the Orthodox way, I think most Orthodox, if not all, would say they have departed and they're very distorted and and not a uh, there's not really a, a, a true u- unity there. They they've broken off from the Church. They've submitted themselves to what we consider to be heresy, which is the Filioque, which they don't say, but they're in communion with those who do, and they, uh, but mainly the papal primacy, which is heretical ecclesiology, um, and there's just a strange coexistence of, from the Orthodox perspective, those heresies along with an Eastern Rite, and if it's a fabrication. It's not. It does not ring true to the Orthodox. It does not, and it's very painful because the methods that they used to bring them and take them in under the Pope, we felt were very deceitful. A lot of simple people in villages around the Ukraine and other places woke up and their bishop was now a unit and nothing changed. And so they didn't feel like they had left the Orthodox faith. And there was a lot of, a lot of struggle on the part of the Orthodox to educate the people around those parts of the world, not to fall away from the Orthodox faith. So Unitism, the method of uh, of the Jesuits and others and the, and their machinations in the East, long history, a lot of pain, a lot of a lot of mis- dis- mistrust on the part of the Orthodox because of well, lots of historical events. Constantinople, a lot of history there where the Jesuits were working with the Ottomans, and their stories we could tell uh, where they're they're deceitfully going about trying to take away Orthodox people into the uh, under the Pope. But the whole ecclesiology, the whole stance of the Pope and the way that he came about trying to force union in other places, bri- you know, political bribery, all kinds of things that were very ugly. And so unionism has a very bad name in the Orthodox Church. It's very, I mean, when I was in Greece, it was one of the, you know, one of the worst parts of of Catholicism for the Orthodox. It was one of the most painful and it was one of the most uh, disdained aspects of Catholicism for the Orthodox because it was such a fabrication. It wasn't true Orthodoxy and it wasn't faithful to the Holy Fathers from the Orthodox perspective. So I don't know. I mean, we could go on with details, but uh, that's the short end of things. John, we will have this Thursday question and answer. That's correct. Maria, God bless you. God bless everybody. All right. All right. So we will be signing off. God bless you. Got to keep you. Oh, Adam, you just got into what, what was the problem, Adam? You couldn't get into Crowdcast. That's terrible. I'm sorry, Adam. I hate these technological problems. I don't know. We did send out an express explanation in Patreon. I guess you didn't see it. Somebody explained how they did it to get in. I don't know why it's so hard. Why do they make it so hard? All right. We will see you on Thursday. Keep us in your prayers. All right, we're out. God bless. Good night. Panagia Mazisas. 